Excellent. Thank you all for being with us today. And thank you, especially to our, our panelists from joining us, various time zones, some at the end of their workday, um, some right at the beginning. So uh, a big thank you. I, I won't introduce the panelists just yet, but I'd like to go through some housekeeping and then pass it on to our panel moderator, Mark Huskinson. So today's panel will be recorded. You may notice if you are a participant that you are unable to um, unmute your microphone or enable your camera. We ask that you please use the chat for any questions and we'll take questions um, in the end. So keep them coming as, as they come to you and we'll be sure to address as many as we're able at the end of the session. Okay. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Huskinson, who is the publishing specialist at PKP and the co-chair of the Assembly of the Commons at Operas. Beginning his career at Cambridge University Press, um, and he's been working at the turbulent confluence of emerging publishing technologies and the evolving business models for over 30 years. And he's also my colleague, and I'm very happy to have him working with me at PKP. Mark is gonna go ahead and um, sort of introduce the panel and also speak about the two organizations that put on this, this panel um, and speak about our anniversaries. And then he'll turn it over to, um, sorry, our representative from Erudi who will also have a few moments to speak. So Mark, thank you very much. Thank you, Arush. That's always slightly embarrassing when someone reads about you. Um, so this uh, is, a, obviously we're near the end of OA week and uh, one of the core reasons for holding this meeting is part partially a celebration of PKP's 25th anniversary. And uh, we start this before we head into the meat of the the, the panel and introducing the, the 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 important people in the room, the panelists rather than me, just as the moderator, and hopefully you'll hear less from me, the better, uh, is just to congratulate Public Knowledge Project on 25 years um, to everybody who's built the software, to everybody who's contributed to the policy and the translations around the policy, uh, around the, the, the software, the, the impact and scale of the uh, of PKP is, is actually really quite humbling in the sense of where are we? There, there are, depending on which data you look at, 85, 90,000 journals, around 12, 13,000 installations globally, of which about 34,000 are active journals. Um, in many, many languages. And when John Wilinski started this project in the late 90s, so 25 years ago, you can do the sums, I can't do it. Um, he, uh, he saw the potential for what the internet could give to the uh, to the, the freeing of knowledge and of, 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 uh, of the decolonization of how scholarly communications are developed in the 90s. And it was a project. It was due to deliver a product and then end the project. But now, at this point, 25 years later, we're probably at a point when knowledge and information has been captured more than any any time previously in history. So the project still has a long way to run. So we're at 25 years. We have a lot to celebrate. But one of the reasons for this meeting is that we, we gather to share learning and to share knowledge and experience about how we can push on with the project and the mission behind it. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Elise, I believe, who's going to introduce uh, Erody and their own celebration. Elise, over to you. Thank you, Mark. So hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. I, I am delighted to be here, and I would like to thank first PKP and especially Rose and Mark, who allow me to speak briefly before this very promising webinar. So this webinar has been organized as Arouge and Mark just said, as part of Erudis and PKP's 25th uh, anniversary celebration. And we're pleased to be taking part of it with Coalition Publica. Uh, and Janet will talk about Coalition Publica more in the in the panel. But um, so Coalition Publica is our national platform. Um, when, when I think about Erudis' uh, 25th birthday, I think of all of how all this has been possible thanks to the collaboration of many partners, publishers and libraries, of course, but also universities, government, associations, and working groups. 
It is by, by working together in a collective effort, as we've been doing with PKP for several years now, in a, in a complementary fashion, that, that we have been able to propose harmonized services to our community in Canada and Quebec, and that will be able to enhance the visibility of research results and, and the support of national journals. Bringing together national portals in this webinar is another way to, to participate in this collective effort by linking national portal towards inter international common goods. So I'm not taking uh, much time and enjoy the webinar. Thank you all panelists and audience for, for being here. Thank you, Elise. And thank you also, Gwendal, for joining us also from RID. Um, who you will see on the panel. Um, I might not ask him any questions because I've not prepared him for any. So if he does get one, you know, it's a surprise. Um, so the panel brings together representatives, as you can see, there, is, there are six in the room who um, whose various projects we hope can elucidate and shed some light on the benefits, challenges um, of, of establishing a, a national or regional portal. Now, there are many reasons to develop, develop uh, portals, which are known as multi-tenancy portals and installations. Um, but today we'll focus largely on what it means in the context of the, the national stakeholders. Um, establishing the, the national portals, um, the, the, just to define what that is, it's a, a collection of journals uh, I'm going to read because my memory is not that great, is published within a geographical location that combines their metadata and sometimes content into a single interface. And these have emerged as a critical priority for regions for various uh, reasons, and, and we'll scratch away and dig into that. So there are, there are in a, an, in an, an, innovat an innovative combination of journal publishing platforms and aggregation layers, and also help with multilingualism, even when English is your first language. Um, so we're gonna look at the more mature um, na regional and national portals first. And then we also have Ruth Hegarty here from Ireland, who's still in the nascent stages of, of establishing a national portal. So hopefully turning to each of you in turn on the panel, we'll start to find get a broad scope of what it means in your context, but also draw out some parallels and can some consistencies between your experience and your learning and the barriers that you see to future success in what you're doing. So if we can start, can I start with Jesper? Uh, Jesper, can you just give a brief outline of who you are, where you're at, uh, the scale of your uh, portal? Um, are you okay to do that? Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I am from the Royal Danish Library. We're working out of Copenhagen and I'm sitting three hours away from Copenhagen in a town called Aarhus. Um, we operate a national platform called syscap.dk which would be journal.dk in English. Um, and present we have 194 different journals and yearbooks on the server with about 130 of them being active. Um, uh, yeah, well, and um, the idea is to publish Danish scientific journals and um, ensure that Danish scientific journals can survive. It's an issue for us because we are a minor language with 6 million people talking Danish. So, so there's not much funding available like economy in, in, in Danish journals. We also try to make sure that new journals can be created. And, and also we had some digitization projects where we wanted to um, give access to difficult articles and material, which would be difficult to get access to. Um, yeah, well, that, that's about the short thing. Uh, we, we chose software because we could connect um, the entire process from submission or peer review to uh, publication. Um, we, we actually had a little project in 2006 looking into different softwares that could do all this. Uh, we chose OGS and that was a wise choice for us. Um, Thank yeah, you. That's about yes. it. No, that's great. Thank you. And over uh, to Anti UC. So the, the the Finnish platform is uh, is also mature. What's the scale of your particular project so far? Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so so like like I mentioned. Uh, so I'm working at the Federation of Finnish Learned Societies, and and we basically host two different platforms there. Uh, we have a platform called Journal.fi. 
uh, which was opened back in 2017. And uh, it's basically based on open channel systems uh, and, and aimed, of, of course, for journals. Uh, Edition of Fi is, is a, a much smaller platform that we just founded like a couple of uh, years ago, and that's meant for book publishers. Uh, and and it, that uses uh, open monograph press. Uh, so so basically, we are we are using PKP software for both of our platforms. Uh, so uh, we we started like we didn't start from scratch with Channel Fi. We we already had like a journey channels back in two thousand and seventeen uh, when we over opened the platform. So we had like this really old uh, OJS installation that dated back to, I think, 2007 or something. But it, it wasn't used that much, uh, like actively. There were journals coming in, publishing maybe one, two uh, issues, then uh, dropping the, the usage of the platform and so on. So so uh, we, we basically wanted to fix that and, and make sure that this is a platform that the publishers do want to use. Uh, so, so when we opened back in 2017, we we saw a really quick rise in the amount of journals, uh, and uh, at the moment we have something like I think 145 is is fairly uh, good number or at least close to 145. Can uh, I just ask, Antis, are they yeah. are they mainly in Finnish or are they multilingual? Yeah, like I, I just I, I think. Just like a couple of weeks ago, I I did uh, like a database query where where I looked at this. Uh, I I'd say it was like uh, ninety percent Finnish. After that, mostly English and uh, some Swedish journals. There are some journals that publish like in in uh, more than one language. For example, French or, or German. But but that that's like a really small portion. Like. One, one, two journals, but a really common thing is to is, to, uh, is for a journal to operate with Finnish and English. So they might have like mainly Finnish content, but then they might have occasional English content. Also, same applies to Swedish content. So a, a mainly uh, Finnish speaking uh, journal might also publish uh, in Swedish, which is okay. like where where OJS really is is valuable for us because it makes that possible fairly easily that's great thank you and as you mentioned swedish romana how where are you based and can you give some background to your context yeah definitely well first thank you so much for inviting us all bringing us all together um i work for the national library of sweden i'm based in stockholm and we run the uh, platform Publicera, which is for open access Swedish scholarly journals. Um, we're a fairly new platform. We started um, in summer of 2021 was when the platform launched. So we're still kind of in our nascent phase. Uh, at present, we have 21 journals live on the platform, but we're very active in conversations with many journals who are interested in coming over. So I think we have about 10 more who have signed the contract and will probably go live within the next, I don't know, maybe five, six months. So that's where we are with with our development of the platform. Um, and in terms of language, we have quite a few journals that publish mainly in Swedish. We have a few that publish only in English. And then probably similar to the Finnish platform, we have quite a few journals that will publish content in multiple languages. So they may be primarily Swedish, but also publish some content in the other Scandinavian languages and often English as well. Um, so definitely for us, it's also helpful that OJS supports multiple languages. Thank you. And Jan Willem in uh, the Netherlands. Sorry, I can't see you um, on the screen. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have open journals. Um, we also started in 2021. Um, we publish, I, th I think about half of the journals are in Dutch, the other ones are uh, in English. Um, we are based at the Royal Academy of Sciences, uh, but we are mainly funded by the Dutch Research Council, uh, next to um, uh, us also charging a hosting fee to journals. 
Um, and I guess we're in a similar position as, as the Swedish. Uh, I, I think that we're moving from project stage to a permanent stage. And that also means that there is a lot of discussion now among uh, universities, librarians, um, research founders uh, about, you know, what is the best position for an organization like Open Journals? Uh, what is the best way to, uh, to finance this? Um, so there's a lot of, yeah, the, the, a lot of developments there, a lot of discussion there. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Ruth last for a good reason. So I'll give you more time to, to ponder, Ruth. But um, Jeanette, for, uh, for Canada, can you give a bit of a background? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So Coalition Publica is a uh, national, we sort of say uh, an open source uh, national infrastructure uh, for supporting uh, scholarly journals in the social science and humanities mainly. Um, and we're supporting them in the transition to sustainable open access. And the partnership um, combines the ERIDZ dissemination platform and the OJS um, uh, sort of distributed network that exists in Canada to uh, enhance that discoverability uh, of those journals um, that are about on the ERIDZ platform, about over 200 active scholarly journals, and around 100 of those are using uh, OJS as well as, uh, as dissemination through ERIDZ. Uh, so we work in a truly national uh, bilingual context, uh, English and French. Uh, our journals are uh, bilingual English and French journals, um, and our teams are bilingual with uh, PKP uh, and ERUZ. Um, and when we speak of location, um, we uh, are... Uh, we respectfully acknowledge that we operate on the unceded uh, territories of the Indigenous peoples uh, that call this uh, land home. Uh, so for myself, I'm speaking from Ottawa, which is on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Um, and we have PKP, which is in BC, and their uh, Simon Fraser University uh, uh, campuses are on the uh, traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, the uh, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, Coquitlam, Keikite, Kwantlen, Semiamu, and Swasan peoples. And our ERIZ team uh, operates out of the University of Montreal, which is on the Ganyaginehaga Nation, which is recognized as the custodians of the unceded lands that include Jojage, which is the island of Montreal. So uh, I just wanted to share that as we gather today to talk about keeping knowledge public, um, that uh, the traditional knowledge keepers uh, uh, stay um, stay in our uh, minds as we as we uh, share today. Uh, so uh, I work with uh, the uh, Coalition Publica towards community engagement, so engaging with our journals and our library partners that host a lot of these journals in their local and regional contexts. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, our mission is to support those journals in a financial way as well as a material support way. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in, the, uh, in the panel. Yeah. Ruth in Ireland. Um, so you're in the nascent stages of establishing a, a national portal. Can you just give an, a, a, an update of where you are and then maybe move the conversation to the, into the next stage around, you know, what was the reason and what's the driver for establishing a, a national portal in Ireland? And then I'll move that to the others along there. But it'd be great to hear your perspective, uh, uh, where you are in, the, in, in your timeline. Yes, well, thank you very much. Um, it's fantastic to hear uh, that it is possible uh, to get a national portal off the ground. Um, my name is Ruth Hegarty and I run the publishing house at the Royal Irish Academy, where we publish six journals and books and reference works. And um, we have applied for and got a grant for two years uh, to look into the possibility of establishing a national portal or at least a piece of infrastructure that will, would allow uh, journal publishers and book publishers to publish um, diamond open access ideally but in our grant application we said that in order to do that we need to understand the publishing landscape in Ireland so some of the first steps that we've had to take we're one year into this two-year grant at the moment so the early steps we've had to take is we've published a directory of Irish publishers which gives us the sense that we've about 210 um publishers in Ireland whether that's somebody one person publishing up to a publishing house and that's book and journal publishers and about 96 of those are book 
publishers or book and book journal publishers and the rest in our journals. Um, so now we know the size and the scope of what we're talking about, uh, uh, possibilities. And we've also uh, started working on surveying the publishers to understand what they need, because this process for us is not just about choosing a platform, it's also understanding what people might need, whether they need to publish in the Irish language, um, what kind of constraints are on them, uh, you know, uh, time is one of the main things that is coming out and what kind of support they might need from the government. So this all sits within a framework, an action plan to um, that the Irish government is, is trying to flip research to be open by 2030. And uh, they have given a series of grants to an organization called NORF, the National Open Research Forum, who are administering the grants on behalf of the government. And so we have a grant um, which has allowed us to hire somebody, a uh, project manager, Lucy Hogan, who's been overseeing that. And we have, you know, multiple organizations involved from the publishers to universities, to libraries, um, to the international organizations. And some of the people here have advised us as well, which has been very useful. Um, so the drive is to, to provide a piece of infrastructure, I think, for, for publishers to simplify it for them, to make it possible. Um, and then in our grant, we've also looked at the knowledge gap that a lot of publishers and individuals who are publishing have. So alongside the looking into which platform we might use, and we've published a comparison um, of the technical specs, we're also developing things like guidelines for authors when they publish open access, guidelines for publishers. Um, and those types of tools, I think, are going to be very useful so that by the time, hopefully next year, when maybe the Royal Irish Academy would be proposing to move into a system and then inviting others to join, that people will be, some people will be ready to join and other people will understand whether they wish to join or not. So is, that, is the major driver um, within that context a, a, a policy mandate government one or is, is because we, we don't we don't enter this quite complicated task just because we want to find out if it's possible I mean maybe some of us do but it, it, it's it's a lot of work to do that do you do you um is it largely a government mandate or do you think it's a, a blend of a mixture of things in Ireland for you to move to this place well I think the government mandate and the library publishing sector has probably created the funding possible. So they wrote an action plan and submitted it to government and, and got uh, um, the grant to make it possible. And for me, what it is, is it's a recognition that particularly journal publishing is such a fast moving environment. And when I look at these 96 book publishers, 10 of whom maybe are academic, and they might have one or two employees in each of these publishing houses or or perhaps up to six or so to recognize that none of us individually can know everything there is to know about open access and can meet all of the requirements that that we need to meet and the only way to do that is for us to work together and I'm quite excited by that possibility that this grant even is um, we're hosting a meeting next week uh, of journal publishers and in my time and I'm at quite a while publishing I don't remember meeting up with other journal publishers just to share so one of the things coming out of our our research now is Yes, we can provide a platform, but ideally the government should also fund a person to support a network so that um, these people can come together and they can ask questions of each other and that that should be supported actually with a staff member. Yeah, and I think that what we're seeing um, across the infrastructure, and I think uh, this came out in the Co Diamond Coalition this week in Toluca at the in OA week, is this, this increasing requirement for different layers of community support in terms of learning and 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 all of us have our own context of why we have to do things and with various resource allocations and restrictions and the rest but actually there's a great deal of learning at different levels and it also helps that you have you just just to say hello to Lucy Hogan if she's listening because she's been a fantastic advocate for Ireland and someone great to work with um in in terms of Sweden Romana is it, what what was the main driver for um, a Swedish platform to be established at, at this point? Well, since about 2006, the National um, Library has been tasked by the government for with promoting, coordinating, and also promoting collaboration uh, among different actors in the work towards open access. And the Swedish government has set a goal that starting in 2021, 
all uh, publications that are the result of research that is pub publicly funded should be made immediately open access. So that's kind of the background. And against that background in 2019, the National Library um, conducted a series of five studies all related to different aspects of open access. And one of the um, recommendations that came out of that study was for the National Library to create and then maintain a platform as a way of providing infrastructural support for these journals and to help them in their transition to open access. So that really is the background behind um, behind how Publicera started and uh, the context in which it was created. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, and for G Jeanette, with Coalition Publica, um, can you, you what was the main driver for the, the establishment of uh, of CP? Uh, yeah, so uh, various team members from uh, PKP and ERUZ have been collaborating uh, for decades on various projects to advance uh, open access, but formally as Coalition Publica, uh, it was around the 2015-16 mark, where there was really recognition that uh, the two organizations working towards that sort of same goal of sustainable and kind of institutionally supported and particularly diamond, um, you know, as, as we call it today, open access, um, operating in the same funding space, uh, that it was more beneficial to both parties to go it together rather than to go it alone. Um, so really that first kind of grant application um, uh, was was what led to that formal partnership or establishment of coalition publica as it exists, and so um, there was that 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 motivation to partner. But I think some of the echoing of the of the um, landscape as it exists in 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 as the previous panelists were talking about that distributed network of open access uh, like OJS supported journals through library publishers in Canada was was very strong, um, but they were sort of lacking uh, a, a centralized dissemination nation point. Um, it's a highly distributed uh, uh, network, which is great. It's a lot of regional expertise, a lot of local contexts, but having that um, national visibility and that um, international visibility that you get through the sort of ERUZ platform with its partnerships um, really kind of drove that, that motivation as well. Um, and then moreover, kind of a desire to directly support journals um, who participate in Coalition Publica uh, financially. So the um, establishment um, spearheaded by Z and the Canadian Research Knowledge Network to uh, establish the partnership on open access, which is a way for libraries to directly fund the journals that are on the Coalition Public Ed platform. Uh, so they can help with their operations because they're generally, you know, very small teams that are on shoestring budgets, not highly supported institutionally. This is a way that their local libraries can participate not only by financially supporting them, um, with direct funding, but through their um, through their local support, through their library publishers. So that was kind of the the context. Um, so it was it was less choosing a platform and more finding. Uh, 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 I think the Canadians in the room might laugh if I say synergies, uh, but um, uh, 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 a collaboration to bring all of those partners uh, together um, was was really the motivation. Yeah, that's great, and I think we start to see a number of words and themes start to emerge, which are the which are the, I'm not going to use those synergies, but are the, 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 the parallels and repeat. Um, for Jesper in uh, Copenhagen, uh, uh, sorry, you're in Aarhus, aren't you? Um, what were the main drivers for um, for the Denmark to, to, to establish this platform? Well, basically, we started out as two servers. Uh, we had two national libraries at that time uh, when they started in 2007. And, and the basic idea was to help Danish journals to, to go digital from, from printed uh, to survive in the new digital environment and get open access. Uh, and then slowly, we, I mean, in Aarhus, we had a lot of subscriptions, but now that has changed to open access. So, so open access came later on. The first idea was to get the Danish journals online. Um, and that was a success. And then we merged. And now we, we have to follow the Danish uh, green open access policy, um, which is quite helpful for us. Um, but the, the basic idea was to save Danish journals. Um, we, mm. we, we have had a lot of gen journals coming in, publishing in Danish and English, that were not economically viable for uh, big professional uh, commercial uh, 
uh, publishers. So, so we sell them onto our platform. Um, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, it, yeah, that is the, 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 what, what comes through is the sense of there is, there's, there's various multilingual issues and I'll come to you next time to you'll see around this, but this kind of the, the, the Danish um, situation and context necessitated the, the requirement for this platform. Um, and uh, more nascent journal, uh, platforms are largely coming from a practical or pragmatic point of uh, resource sharing, efficiency of resource, helping smaller um, smaller publishers meet the, the 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 policies and the mandates. So it's it's quite fascinating, but it's great to hear uh, Denmark's case. And uh, Ante Jussi, for what was the original reason for for Finland's uh, um, investment in a national portal, and and has that changed since since its um, inception? Yeah, I think that that we have maybe a, a bit different kind of back background in in that uh, like we're not officially a national platform. Like, like uh, I think that that most of the people that that call us a national platform are not Finnish, <laughs> because we we probably seem like a national platform, uh, and and the background for that is 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 pretty much like the. Finnish publishing landscape. Uh, it's it's a bit different from many countries in that uh, most of the publishers are learned societies. Like uh, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's really high. They they are like really small learned societies, and at the same time they are also our member societies. So the members of the Federation of Finnish Learned Societies, and our our platform really started as a service. Uh, we have a lot of other services as well for our members, uh, member societies, and our platform started as a service for our member societies. And uh, we just decided back in 2017 and that we will start onboarding also other Finnish journals besides the, the learned society uh, journals that we have. Uh, but we are basically in, in now in, in a like a de facto situation where where we are a, a national portal. Uh, I, I think that the figure for for Finnish uh, publishing series is somewhere around three hundred maybe, and and there's a big number of those R book series like like in Ireland. Uh, so so with one hundred and forty journals, we are of course fairly high. But yeah, it was really a service because, uh, and and in that regard, it's it's a similar story for, for like like many have already mentioned that these are small publishers; they can't do this by they by themselves. Uh, so so it, this is like uh, giving a, a third resource, uh, and 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 uh, basically enabling them to to publish uh, in in open access. Thanks, Antio. See, just before I move on, are, anyone else from the panel want to add something about the reason for why the, their own particular platform came into being? I didn't want to move on without giving you the opportunity to to speak. I no, suppose actually, and, and while Mark... you were there, Antio, see um, the um, well, oh, sorry, yep, sorry, do, do go. So, sorry, Mark, but just one uh, final thing was um, one other impetus was coming from the authors who enjoy publishing with their indigenous presses and were concerned that with the move to open access that they would um, not be able to facilitate them just through lack of no knowledge and resources, but that they that they have these great relationships with them, the book publishers and the journal publishers. And so they wanted to be able to maintain that and, and maintain the, the biblio diversity. Yeah. No, that's 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 really interesting, and for you, uh, in terms of obviously your uh, there are the immediate concerns and immediate drivers for where Ireland OA is is currently at in terms of pilot and and um, and working out which software to work with, which partners to work with, and how to how to establish that infrastructure within Ireland. What's the the longer term gain uh, goal for for the platform as a whole? Well, I guess it's to have a flourishing publishing um, 
industry in Ireland um, that will be able to facilitate people, whether they're occasional publishers or, or regular publishers with, mm. with open open access. I guess that's the, the fundamental goal. And and added to that, that there that there is a really good network um, in Ireland yeah. uh, for publishing. And beyond that, um, I don't really know. I think that is that is the basic um, ambition. And what we're also recognizing, though, is that there are a lot of people already publishing in a lot of other ways, and we can't expect everybody to join whatever infrastructure we develop and offer. And so looking at overlays or to, to, to create a genuine national portal, um, we will have to look at solutions. You know, we were talking to people in Meru in the US and these kinds of solutions where you could actually bring together all kinds of different um publishing um so that you could consume a national you could see ireland's national output yeah. while allowing everybody to to publish however they wish so it kind of apologies if i play the devil's advocate a little bit here but um so in, in do you think that there is a wider context within publishing that would threaten that flourishing that would potentially threaten the ability for small individual publishers and individual you know that whole kind of varied ecosystem that exists in Ireland around academic publishing is do you see the platform as as providing a way forward of, of security and 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 foundation for those to continue yeah I mean there is a risk that some publishers would just find it too complex to take on um they wouldn't be set up to create the business models without a you know a report or some advice on how to establish business models, which is something that we're looking at. You know, did, could you have micropayments? Could you have subscriptions? Could you have membership models? Could you have a combination of state funding and and all of those things? Um, and certainly the grand narrative is that the bigger publishers, you know, will be better set up for that, and and that there is always a business model. You just need to to find what is right. Uh, but I think there's a genuine ambition to conserve the indigenous publishing that we have. Um, and I think there's an opportunity for them. And I think the opportunity is by working together. And it's a very small. I mean, I'm talking, you know, we're talking about maybe 10 book publishers and 114 journals. So it, it should be manageable uh, to support them. That's kind of just a very quick thought that popped into my head. It's that kind of thing of. When we when we think about kind of global scholarly communications in the same way we think about global economics, numbers start to lose their meaning, don't they, in some ways. So I started this by going there are 35,000 active journals on OJS. And in some ways that kind of sweeps over the fact that there is, you know, there are a huge number of those which are one or two people operating largely, sometimes in isolation. And there is a community here which is basically one reason the national portals exist, but one reason also why the, the public knowledge project and organizations like Coalition Publica exist and others is to remove that kind of, that really quite emotive word, just, it's just one person. We, it shouldn't just be one person. It is one person on a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting ecosystem that a community based around open infrastructure can really support. So that's that's really great. And, and for you, Jesper, in 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 Denmark, so you your practical reasons for um defending and um helping Danish journals survive, it, it, what's the long-term vision do you think? How, do you think you have obviously you've you've served at, I'm gonna be again Apologies for being so so brusque, but you've served the initial purpose, which is enabling you those journals to continue. Do, do you have a, a vision for where Denmark would like to go next with this platform? Well, basically just to grow slowly. We have a lot of journals who are not on this platform or the other few uh, Danish OGS platforms. I think we'll go more into a monograph press and start if negotiations goes right, uh, start some kind of national platform of the small service we have there. Uh, so basically to keep the OGS server running and uh, expand into Monograph Press um, where we have some issues. Uh, we need to publish uh, PhD theses, technical reports and get that into a more stable flow as well. Um, mm. and, and a lot yeah. of the Danish publishers won't be able to do this open access because they need funding. Um, we, we can at least give them the infrastructure for this. Yeah, that's great. Um, Thank you. 
And, and in terms of, uh, so let's pick on anti-UC with this one. So for, for Finland as well, so you're already at a large scale um, and it's not a, it, it's not a commercial enterprise. Obviously, we have resource issues to consider, but it's not about growth for growth's sake. In terms of uh, Finland, um, in terms of your longer term vision, where do where do you where do you see? Um, whilst you're not a, a de facto, you're not a national platform, but where do you see your uh, portals headed? Yeah, I think that 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 we we've concentrated a lot on like solving technical things, uh, like like. Uh, developing the the platform itself uh doing uh, participating in in generally in, in OJS development and doing plugins and so on and and what, what we've like really come to realize during the last few years is that that while we have grown so fast uh we've realized that we we don't really have much forms for like governance <laughs> or like 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 doing like community building or or things like that. They they've been all, always something that we don't have time for. Well, of course, like the, the our whole service is is like basically technical. So we provide a technical platform. We provide technical support. But what we would really want to do is is to to take uh uh concentrate more on, on on making like a good governance model and especially like enabling the editors to become part of the governance of the platform that they like they, they are they are active towards us in, in many like technical things and we get a lot of good feedback from them which we also also send back to pkp for for develop developing new things for the software but but like um but like I, I don't know if if I'm talking about maybe like a steering group or something, but 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 to make them more part of of, of maintaining the platform and also at the same time like uh, creating a community among them uh, that that they are like open access publishers and and maybe like using a a common platform could be a a that kind of a a thing that combines them and and. And and enables them to come together, and this is actually something that I realized when when I think we were actually talking with Jan Willem uh, and with the Iris uh, uh, Iris project, and and uh, I think Jan Willem mentioned that they have this like uh, OJS day that they arrange for for the Dutch uh, uh, Dutch publishers, and I thought it was just a so great idea <laughs> that I immediately immediately decided that we need to have something like this, and 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 that that's probably why why I've uh, I've started to talk uh, think about like like this kind of a community thing. So yeah, like of course te te technical issues are still important, and we are still going to concentrate on them. But but may maybe maybe we need to focus more on 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 people uh, as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. Again, and it, it kind of brings us to that point of where people kind of enter the process and how they frame the process. So for you, it was largely technically driven. And of course, we still have the ongoing technical issues of interoperability across open infrastructure and the rest and the support. Um, and and then you have platforms which have begun, like yours, Jan Willem, where you've begun this and then there are potentially um, issues which sit around governance issues which you didn't initially predict at the start but have basically come about as you've begun to operate is for for, for the netherlands what do you see that the longer term kind of vision and strategy for for for, for, the, for your platform um well it's it's growth of course as well uh getting more journals but i think that we find that now we mainly have journals uh small journals mainly in the humanities and social sciences that are keen to um, uh, be open access and we help them there. Um, I, I think we want to seduce uh, journals that are now with a commercial publisher to uh, move over to open journals. But I think we can only do that if our services are kind of compatible with, with the services of, of other publishers. And I think uh, that takes time. 
Um, I think what is also interesting is that uh, we also find that although we initially started as a platform, as a service provider, um, I mean, one of the elements in starting this project uh, for us was to say, well, um, we want organizations, we want academic organizations to be in control of the publishing process. So we're just a platform. We give our technology to a society or a university press and, and they do that. Um, but we do find that um, uh, other journals and even university presses need additional services. Uh, for example, um, how do we create publicity for our journal? or um, even editorial services, uh, how, do we, how, how do we do that? Um, finance is an issue we see um, because we are um, uh, charging a hosting fee. Um, and for some journals, that's not a problem because they're society backed or university backed or something like that. Uh, but a lot of journals, they just hop on from uh, a, a single one of subsidy to the next single uh, one of subsidy, which is a bit, um, a, a bit of a problem because a journal, of course, is something that is supposed to be there for a long time. So uh, we're actively kind of coaching universe, uh, journals as well, saying, well, this is something you could look into or we know of this fund. And, and we're also trying to bring journals together. If there are a bunch of journals around a certain subject, um, maybe um, they can uh, look for sustainable finance in, in a particular organization that is aimed at historians or educational specialists or something like that. Um, so I think our long-term vision is, is, is we are a platform now. I don't think we want to become a full-blown publisher, but something in between. So we're actually saying that we want to become an expertise center um, which is uh, the platform and the additional sur the additional services journals need as well. Yeah, and just while you're you're on my screen, uh, Jan, well, the, we will dig into resource and financial models a little in a little while because it, it's kind of almost the question that needs asking in 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 terms of how we all build a sustainable and robust open infrastructure. That kind of is the one question that's fairly common across most most um, most platforms. For you, what um, for the Netherlands? Uh, how do, uh, so? You charge a fee per publisher. Any other financial um, models you use to help with bringing revenue in, or is that largely? Well, that is. So at the moment, I think about seventy percent of our finance comes from the research council. Uh, I think another fifteen percent comes from universities that have a very active open science policy, and then we charge the journals. Um, one of the requirements that we have is that those journals should be diamond open access. Um, but more and more journals are saying, yeah, but, you know, is there some wiggle room there? Um, um, we have some journals that still have a print issue with, with uh, subscriptions. Um, uh, we're kind of struggling about, well, that is okay, but, but there will be journals that say, well, can we at least have an embargo period? Um, mm -hmm. At the moment, we don't allow that, um, but is that something we should rethink? Um, basically, my opinion is that if the academic world wants open science, then the academic world should pay for open science as well. So, so I, I do think it is mainly universities, university libraries, academic organizations that have to pick up the bill. Um, at the same time, I think that bill could be reduced if there is very active collaboration between journals, because I do think that the way that small journals are now working is very um, inefficient. Um, um, and I think that if they would work more closely together, um, the expenses could be reduced as well. So, and I'm, I'm just hoping that there is some sort of a sweet spot where, where expenses are reduced and the academic community says, well, you know, this is, this is acceptable for us. No, that's great. Thank you, Jan Willem. And, and for you, Romana, in, in Sweden, is the, the, what um, what barriers have you faced? It, it, I, I, I'm kind of assuming that finance will, or financial resources will be in there somewhere. But on, on the whole, for Sweden, was that a is that a, is finance a high salience barrier, or have there been other barriers which have been um, harder to overcome for establishing the portal and helping it grow? 
Well, funding, yes, definitely is an issue. I think it is for most, if not all, journals. Um, we do not charge a fee for journals to be on the platform, but we also don't offer any funding. So a lot of times they are um, relying on the same things that Jan mentioned, the subscription fees. Um, none of the journals at this point charge APCs. We allow it, but most of them don't want to go down that route. So yeah, funding is definitely something that um, journals are grappling with. And even though we don't charge a fee, you know, there are, of course, uh, costs involved in terms of production and proofreading and all the things that go into um, publishing a journal. So it is one of the things that we found um, sometimes is a barrier to journals joining the, the platform. Another thing that I would say sometimes is a barrier is we have certain requirements for the journals that join. So, for example, um, aligning with the criteria that Do Directory of Open Access Journals has, we require that they publish 15 peer-reviewed articles under a three-year period. And for some journals, that's just a little bit too high a bar, especially considering many of them are heavily reliant on voluntary labor. So, of course, time is the other thing that there's never enough of. Um, so we find that some journals really would like to join the platform and are very excited about the prospect, but find that maybe at this point they can't meet the requirements that we have. Um, so one of the things that we are hoping is to also collaborate with other, with the Swedish Research Council and with other organizations in Sweden to make sure that the funding is there to help with that aspect, and then also to um, provide more knowledge so that journals understand that, okay, maybe they can't re meet the five uh, peer-reviewed articles per year right now, but over time, they may be able to uh, evolve so that they're able to, to join the platform. Because, um, yeah, I would say those are probably the two main obstacles right now is the meeting the requirements, funding, and then sometimes it also is a question of um, it, the diversity of journals and whether what we can offer through one technical solution, whether it meets the needs of all of them, ranging from the ones who have, you know, many require many requests for functionality to the ones that maybe don't have so much time to learn a new system. So kind of finding a way to meet all of these various needs. Yeah. That's great. And um, for you, Jeanette, in Canada, so I, wanna, I don't want to pick on you too much, but um, obviously Coalition Publica, RD and, um, and, and uh, PKP is well established. So is, what barriers, obviously it's well established now, but what barriers do you see going forward? And, and I think you're in a quite good situation relatively because of Canada's lack of commercial publishers in, in the landscape, which is kind of unusual in the sense of for the panelists here that most panelists within their within their regional context will have a, a, a high proportion of commercial publishing activity whereas Canada se seems to be a, a an area where there aren't that many commercial publishers uh yeah precisely so it's a highly non-commercial uh landscape uh with uh, obviously uh APZ coalition publica being a, a non-profit and the um, financial piece is really a, a cost recovery for the expertise that uh, is really in the teams, um, the uh, the production expertise and the uh, the assistance with meeting different standards for publication, uh, quality metadata, for example, high quality XML. So there's a lot of uh, uh, that in in the uh, in the funding, but um, I think some of the some of the similar um, barriers. They kind of echo as well um, the difference in uh, capacities of journal teams uh, to transition towards sustainable open access. So while 95% of the content is in fully open access, there are still some um, rolling walls, some 12 month rolling wall journals. Uh, on the platform and as the policy landscape changes in Canada, um, ensuring that those journals are sustainable, um, re-examining our um, uh, financial models to ensure that uh, it's more equitably spread, that sort of partnership for open access, the direct library funding, that it is um, helping those journals move and continue to thrive and survive, um, even though it is sort of non 
commercial um, mostly, and this is thanks to um, uh, some great research that's being done by our library publisher community um, and our AHZ teams, uh, there's still there's still financial considerations. They're small teams. They're uh, shoestring budgets. There is uh, help from uh, uh, we're mainly in the social science and humanities. So the uh, uh, SHRC, which is the uh, Social Science Humanities Research Council in Canada, does provide financial support, but it is it is um, it's a it's a struggle to get that. Um, not everybody gets it. It's a lot of work to get it. So uh, I think for us, uh, really collaborating with the expertise and the partners that we have, again to to make those connections, the journals having connection to the library expertise, having connection to the production expertise um, to help align with the better practices, and best practices in open access uh, publishing is really where, um, you know, where, where that, even though we're established, um, the struggles of even uh, newly or nascent um, platforms just very much rings, uh, rings the same uh, in the Canadian context as well. Yeah. So just just as a quick reminder to all the people who are in the webinar, that just please do ask questions if if you want to know specific questions being asked, because there will be things that I'm not asking and we might not be able to uh, speak into directly into your context. So please do drop some questions in because it will help all of us if we uh, we broaden the questions um, into these. But for now, just specifically, Jeanette, in terms of the the financial model for uh, Coalition Publica. Um, is it is it largely reliant upon central federal funding, or is there other revenue streams as well? And 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 for the individual journals and editorial boards in the platform on the platform, you know, are there different um, revenue models and financial uh, uh, sustainable models within that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, Coalition Publica itself is sustained uh, by uh, grants and by institutions. So I mentioned previously the institutional home of PKP being Simon Fraser University. Um, and uh, EHUZ is supported through a consortium of three Quebec university libraries. So their, their physical home uh, is based at Université de Montréal, but there's Université Laval and Université de Québec à Montréal which also supports um, that, the, the, the EHUDZI team. And that's been established, as we know, for 25 years. Um, uh, but the, the financial model that exists for the journals, um, so the grant funding supports the operations of Coalition Publica and the development of the infrastructure. So that is financed through uh, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, uh, major science initiative grants, and that's really for the interoperability of the two platforms, so the technical development, the ensuring that the technical standards are met. Um, the funding from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council is to really help those journals adhere to those best practices but the big financial piece for uh for uh for journals participating is the partnership for open access which is as i mentioned a um a collaboration uh or uh, an initiative led by ahudz in partnership with uh, crkn which is our national uh, consortia for library to do so they're the ones who negotiate with Elsevier and, and etc and so uh, we have uh, those libraries who subscribe to the ARUZ platform so there is um, there is you know financial uh, revenues from that sort of uh, that subscription type model but the partnership for open access is really a voluntary amount that the libraries choose to contribute to according to their um, to their institutional um, band in, in Canada. It's sort of, you know, are they a large institution, medium, small institution? And it's a voluntary donation. And that money goes directly to the journals. So while there is um, uh, um, a, a, a cost for participation on the platform to pay for that expertise for, for the XML, for example, and the metadata, um, the goal of being a journal on Coalition Publica is to be revenue generating for the journals so that they actually do walk away with, um, you know, with some funding at the end of the year to uh, pay for support for, um, you know, student uh, student work and things like that. So we'll be, um, uh, Erudzi will be uh, 
that partnership has been extended, I think, until 2025, um, and it will be renegotiated. So we do hope that the libraries that we work with see the value uh, that that this collaboration across Canada is bringing to sustaining the journals that, that exist on their campuses, right? Those are the journals that are being produced in their institutions, and many times hosted within their institution as well. So really kind of closing that loop of that institutional funding is uh, is the main sort of thing. Now, obviously there are still, like I mentioned, some who are operating uh, on a subscription model, but uh, as we transition, we hope that those um, those funds, those revenues will, will be more evenly spread amongst open access, uh, all the open access journals. Um, but it's really that, 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 that partnership that we're, we're, we're hoping to continue um, for, for many years to come so that, so that this is a sustainable transition, that it's a permanent transition. This is, this is something that they can rely on year after year and not have to necessarily go and, and find grant funding, for example, um, on, a, on a cyclical basis, which, which is very labor intensive and, and demanding as far as their time, uh, which is yeah. already stretched very thin. Thank you. And, the, and and looping back around to you, Ruth, in the sense of so at the beginning of this kind of, well, you know, at the beginning has been a long way to get to where you are at the moment. But what do you what have you seen as the barriers to establishing the, the, the national platform and then drawing in? Um, how do you see the the, the 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 financial model that you might employ um, as, as, a, as, a, as a platform as a whole? Uh, well, I think. I think initially some of the barriers are time and the challenge of changing your workflow from what you can just about manage to produce and what you're doing right now. So I I, I think um, the process that we're doing now, which is allowing people to pilot different versions, allowing people to come to events to learn about what might be possible and over the next year providing support to people if they want to try out a journal that we will we will help them to get it up in it so that that early um, time investment can be reduced because Lucy Hogan will actually support people to to try and do that. So I think that's the biggest challenge is and of course time is connected to funding. Um, and then for the financial models as you, you, we're at the very early stages of that, but we're thinking that uh, we probably would be writing proposal for government um, to suggest that they might fund in the first instance three people to to help us set that up. Um, and the reason being that the community element is as important as the technical element. Um, we started conversations with people like IRL, who would be a consortium of university libraries. Uh, I, we have in the Royal Irish Academy, we have a read and publish agreement with them. And so starting to think about, would they be interested in funding infrastructure? Um, like, and it's quite exciting to hear uh, about Jeanette's um, system f for that. But they are asking the questions, which are very obvious, of course, is should they be um, funding this type of infrastructure or would the role would it be better coming from central government um, and then for us our questions are well do you put all your eggs in one basket and if you give up on any read and publish or subscribe to open agreements that each of the individual journal publishers or the membership um, structures that they have just for this piece of infrastructure which is all we're looking at um, will that mean that we won't build something sustainable so we're looking at a mix of course we're looking at a mix um, but I think if we can offer a platform and editorial community support that's centrally funded in some way, shape, manner or form, it will still allow each of the journal publishers to, you know, seek funding in, in the different ways that they have all been doing for years. Mm. Um, and if we can facilitate that, uh, the main barrier will be the time that um, each of them yeah. have. No, thank you for that. And it's really interesting. And, and you know, going back to what Yellen Willem was saying around uh, the fu the funding sources and the rest, I think, you know, and Jeanette uh, referred to it as well, this whole thing of, you know, this lack of um, enthusiasm to support infrastructure, which supports this huge range and this huge wealth of bibliodiversity globally. But even in this room, there must be, what, 400, 500 journals being supported on a tiny proportion of the finance required to support many other structures which exist within the scholarly communications um, world. And, uh, you know, the, the whole process of 2.5% of library collections budgets being put into this. And, and I think 
with with funders you know most of the conversations tend to focus largely on the external output of the journals rather than the infrastructure which supports that and so so much money goes into apcs which are non-sustainable in the sense of it's spent the money's extracted from the system rather than money spent into the infrastructure which is then a, a, a sustainable ecosystem building amount of investment and and, and so within that um just in, intrigued to know uh, the governance structures because some of some of you are national platforms officially um, and some of you are de facto national platforms by just the nature of being your size and scale in in a nation um just want to kind of pick away at, at, at how who who is responsible for the platforms in the sense of where where does that sit within the wider scholarly community and academic community within your individual countries? And um, just before I do ask about the governance question, is is there anything anybody wants to add around um, kind of barriers to building a national platform or on finance models? And also, just as a reminder to anyone in the room, if you want to ask questions, help me out. Add one. Um, otherwise, I have to keep asking questions. Um, I do have some. But, um, your questions will be far more inter interesting than mine. Um, so on, on governance, then, if no one has anything to say on, on financial um, um, and uh, portal establishment barriers. Um, it, actually, let's go back to Jan Willem because um, of, of where we just came from. In terms of your governance structure, where where how where does it sit and what challenges do you see around that? Um, very interesting. Um, uh, you asked the question, who owns the platform? Uh, I think here the answer right now is we don't know. Uh, we, we are very much, uh, as I said, moving from a project to a permanent organization. Uh, the project organization was kind of simple because there was, there was money and there's a hosting organization. There is a steering committee. Um, and now uh, we're trying to move into a permanent uh, organization. We, we have a um, regular meeting where uh, the National Research uh, Council, uh, universities, university libraries, the National Library meet to figure out how to do that. And I think what we will end up uh, eventually is, is having a... Um, uh, yeah, a, a council existing of, of these bodies. So academics, librarians, uh, and funders. Um, and they will also be the ones that are taking uh, the main decisions. Uh, the, the, the questions that I raised earlier, like, you know, what are the requirements exactly? What kind of financial models do we allow? Uh, we, we have those questions, but we're not really sure who should be answering those questions. Um, also, th this is part of a larger open science movement or open science policy that's happening in the Netherlands. It's not only about uh, publishing journals, but it's also about data management. It, it, it's reward and recognition. And because this is such a large discussion with so many, so many organizations, I think it is um, moving slowly. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think eventually it will be the academics, it will be um, the, the research funders, and it will be the librarians that will um, uh, well, will be the governance of open journals. And next to that, we are also actively building a um, yeah, user board and, and user board uh, for several reasons, uh, just to interact with them and, and tell them, well, this is how you use the platform. But also, well, this is how you could um, uh, get your funding. Um, but also because we want to have a body that that also tells us, uh, okay, this is uh, where our needs are, or, or we, we want to engage more with the end users um, to tell them um, in what direction we should be moving. So um, I think eventually we will have like a supervisory board. Um, we will have a user council. And then we will have an executive council, and the executive uh, the executive board will then be um, mainly representative from the hosting organization. Uh, so we're thinking along the lines of having those three layers. Yeah, now that's really really helpful in terms of actually positioning um, where we all sit with our uh, various infrastructures and various um, endeavors that we exist within this open science structure within a, a much longer traditional academic 
uh, reward system. And Utrecht's um, recent um, decision to extract themselves from the uh, from the ranking systems is is fascinating um, because of the implications around what that actually means systemically and and systematically for for all of us as we operate within the system. Because obviously we are only one minor part within that. Do you, do you see any kind of? Um, I mean, can, just for those who don't know, Jan Willem, are you able to speak into how Utrecht um, have made that decision and what they've decided to do? Oh, you're just on mute. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know the exact details, but the university has decided that they won't don't want to uh, be a member or don't want to be a participant in this ranking system, in which universities are ranked uh, mainly based on uh, citations or number of publications. So they're not sending that information to um, the organizations that make those rankings. And this is part of a bigger um, movement that say, well, the way that academics or researchers should be judged is not only on, on the output, but should also be on elements like uh, teaching or open science attitudes or, or, or anything that, that happens in, in the academic uh, uh, organization. So they've taken a conscious uh, decision to extract themselves out of those systems. Um, at the same time, I can also say that there is a very vivid debate about that uh, because um, um, yeah, I, th I think this is something, and I think that's an interesting element in general. There are, of course, different disciplines within science and the way that uh, social scientists look at uh, things like uh, impact factor or the way that um, uh, physical scientists do, that's very different. So for some researchers, um, yeah, getting that recognition through impact factors and cit citation records is more important than for others. Um, so I think it's a very brave, courageous decision of Utrecht University to take this step. Um, but there is there is some pushback as well. Yeah, no, understandably, because it's, it's radical in the context of everything else that's going on um, and very yeah. brave. So, But it, um, it's also true that I think the existing publishing ecosystem very heavily relies on that, that, that for academics, it is important to citation. This is why... Uh, established journals kind of manage to um, keep their strong position because um, this is what all the scientists are looking at. And I think that is also part of the motivation of Utrecht University to do that. If you really want to uh, change the publication um, ecosystem, then this is a pillar that needs to be removed. Fantastic. Thank you, Jan Willem. Um, anyone else on a governance? I know Jeanette has something to say around governance. I know you've touched upon it in, in terms of the funding and the barriers. I just wondered if uh, in terms of such a distributed and disparate um, group of, uh, of, of, of partners within uh, Coalition Public, how, how does the governance work in Canada? Um, so we have within Coalition Publica uh, a steering committee, which is really the um, sort of the governance instances of um, PKP, SFU and IRUZ, uh, um, uh, UDM. Uh, and so so that's really the, 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 the steering committee. Uh, we also have an international stakeholder advisory committee. Um, and we also have a, um, or sorry, an international advisory committee and a stakeholder uh, committee. So, um, but then we also have um, two user groups. So we have a journal user group and a library user group. And that's really that sort of community connection that we're really uh, looking to uh, to strengthen and foster that connection. Uh, the library publishers in, in Canada are, are organizing to be a, uh, uh, a, a bit more of a, um, a defined unit so that we can uh, work together to advance our communal goals. Um, so we'll be working uh, particularly with them and with our journal user community to really make that connection between the needs of the journals and what the expertise of sort of the library and uh, the EFZ PKP teams can do to um, sort of bring all of that together. So uh, there is a, a, a reasonable amount of governance. Um, some of it uh, is, is, is required. Um, by by uh, by 
you know, the, the necessity of, of getting grants and making sure that we demonstrate good governance. But I think um, more than that is the strength that you get from community engagement and governance to continue your goals in the long term. Uh, you know, what Anti UC was saying about um, moving forward technically is, you know, we, we obviously concentrate on that within our teams, but um, uh, it, We've noticed, I've noticed that in previous positions as well. You sort of, you concentrate on getting a project and, um, you know, you can get it done fast because you need to concentrate on it. But if you want to go, you know, if you want to go far, if you want to have a long-term approach, it's bringing in communities and it's making sure that you're aligned to um, to the needs of the institutions, but also to the, the partners within those institutions. And then, like I said, we had that international stakeholder advisory committee or international stakeholder committee uh, that really were looking at, you know, the global, um, the global norms and partners within that, right? So partnering with directory of open access journals, for example, to make sure that journals on the AHUZ platform uh, in Coalition Publica are indexed in directory of open access journals, uh, working with uh, the orca.ca consortium to uh, make sure that they're using um, persistent identifiers, for example, in accordance with the, the sort of uh, persistent identifier uh, strategy that's being sort of uh, elaborated and developed nationally in Canada. So so, um, you know, that that recognition that we're, you know, governance is sometimes a, a, a heavy word, <laughs> um, but I think what, if you imagine it as sort of the partnerships and the connections that you can make, um, all of a sudden sort of, you know, having having meetings is, 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 is less heavy and it's more an opportunity to align goals and to make sure that you're moving in the same direction that people are aware of, you know, the 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 policy changes or the international tendencies and keeping up with those, but also leading in those and showing how, how, how we're sort of, um, you know, not just operating within our national context, but really in that global context as well. Uh, so, so we do have a very uh, elaborate, but important governance structure uh, in place in coalition publica and the, the work of those groups um, we rely on uh, to for our yeah. success. So yeah, yeah. I, d I don't know whether it's me just getting old, but <laughs> I'm feeling more comfortable with that heavy word um, of governance. Is that actually within the community structure, at used correctly, it actually can be very rewarding in the sense of what input and what what to use an Americanism, you know, that kind of cross pollination of ideas and thinking of between governance and between financial structures and the rest of what we've discussed. In, in the last- I'll, I'll just add, I, sorry, I just wanted to please. mention one thing. One of the things about um, uh, that we're really uh, proud of is uh, that, that cross pollination as well. So our library user group and our journal user group has a, uh, within their meeting frequency, one joint meeting a year. And so we've we've just established this these groups. They're in their first years uh, of running. Uh, but uh, for anybody who's thinking of establishing these types of groups, um, highly recommend having some joint meetings because the exchanges uh, that happened in that were so engaging and so um, exciting to be a part of that everybody was uh, really had an opportunity to talk about what their needs were and and how you know how they can help each other so if anyone is looking to establish governance structures that's something that I would uh, and we're definitely going to look at how to do that um, not just within the official structures, but with the larger communities and their representatives in Canada. Yeah, and just for I do enter into that last bit, just another shout out to the various organizations who hold sprints, for example, like PKP and Craft OA and, and others, that the, there is just a the, there is an assumption that when you use the word sprint, we're talking about software development, but we're largely talking about the whole spectrum of what involves um create uh, supporting whether it's the governance whether it's you know whatever piece it might be a sprint is there to help the community deliver for the community and so um when you see one being held it's not a hackathon it's not you know turn up with your laptop and and code it's much more about sharing viewpoints and sharing um uh, uh you know um your perspectives and your learnings in the same way that this is to a degree but in a much more informal uh, scenario. So I'd really recommend um, if there is a sprint or a, a, with any of those organizations, it's really worthwhile getting involved with them. And on that point around mentioning Craft OA and 
uh, as um, Arush said at the start, I, you know, I wear the co-chair ha- operas in in Europe. What what um, can PKP? Or actually, let's talk about the op- broader open infrastructure. What can the developers of the various tools within um, the infrastructure do to help and to prioritize f- for your road, your 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 development? You know what we've looked at in terms of your plans and your ideas going forward. How how can how can we as infrastructure providers and tool providers um, prioritize developments to help your own roadmaps? How how do we go about doing that? Is there anything you would like to see, Jesper, in in Denmark? Well, basically, so to continue, basically to continue what you're doing, um, we had the fortune to to organize a sprint, and one of the things that gets out of these things is not only what you code. At the sprint, but but for the dialogue between the different partners. I mean, just by listening to what's been discussed here today, I I think I'll contact some of the good people here, and then to facilitate 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 these things um, where we can go into at times informal dialogue is is really 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 helpful. Um, I mean, we yeah. we have few OGS servers in Denmark, and we meet with them. There are some in Sweden. We meet with them. But it's always nice to to meet other people from completely different places because they think in different direct directions, and we really need to learn from that. Uh, yeah, so so, so please keep up the good work. And I'm not going to try and say facilitate because I had so much trouble with the innovative earlier. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I look, you know, I'm English. I this is my language, and I still fail to say it properly. So. Uh, thank you for that, Jesper. Um, and um, just thinking around what other things, uh, Andy, you'll see in terms of you know the Finnish perspective, are there things that the open infrastructure as a whole or PKP specifically? Because obviously PKP is just one part of a much, much larger ecosystem um, of open infrastructure. Are there things that we can do and work towards that would support your goals and uh, objectives? Yeah, well, I, I also created that PKP has already done a lot and, and is doing a good job in it. Like like in practical level, uh, uh, like national portals, national national services are in the end like big uh, services and big platforms. Uh, and I think that the the problems uh, that that we encounter are always like similar problems that probably all the other big platforms also encounter. So just like the questions of managing the multiple channels in one platform, uh, like questions of like scaling the, the, the system and, and like questions of multilinguality are probably among the most important ones. Uh, and I, I think that that these are like 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 I said in practical practical level things that that maybe haven't gone under that much scrutiny. Uh, in in development in in the recent years, and that's probably simply because well I know for like uh, that the testing that we do are, is usually based on on one channel installations, and most of the journals using OJS are one channel installations. So so the problems that we encounter as big platforms are very much different from the uh, problems that the other platform or other journals are and people using OJS probably encounter. So, so maybe like that, that's, that's on on the practical level, an important thing. The other thing is, is like, uh, uh, again, the people like, like we, we get a lot of good feedback from, from our editors. And I think that it's, it's the same with all the other uh, similar, similar platforms and similar services. Uh, and, and we we tend to of course tell about that feedback to PKP, but I think that that could be like a resource that PKP could use more, like even more directly. I, I know that that PKP does does their own hosting and has a lot of clients, and that's like the database they use to get feedback uh, from. But but this could be like like potentially also also a good source of, of feedback and information the, the bigger national platforms and, and the users of those platforms. Yeah. And uh, Jan-Willem, uh, I know um, 
is there anything you would like to add at the end or um, uh, well I, I just agree with what Ante Yusin Jesper said I think <laughs> that indeed um, managing a, a national platform or a large platform requires different tools uh, I also heard during the last sprint that PKP PKP's focus is is really uh, traditionally focused on one or two journals but um, yeah one, one thing to mention if you have large platforms and you're onboarding journals all the time uh, we very often have to deal with journals that have uh, a backlist and we have to add those uh, older articles to the platform at the moment that's a very inefficient process and it would be great if there is a tool that would help us uh, another example is um, and, and and this is also why it's good for platforms to speak because maybe there is a solution but we would really like to have uh, statistics usage statistics across the platform I think you can only have statistics on a single journal level I'm not sure but that that would be a specific need that you have if you're dealing with uh, dozens of journals uh, and I can think of other things that will only yeah. pop up if you are dealing with uh, dozens of journals. Yeah, no, that's really good. And, and you know, just a, as a as a contextual thing, that the whole issue around migration of back back shoes and legacy content is is a massive issue for the industry as a whole, and actually has contributed to the lock in to commercial infrastructure a great deal because it's so difficult to migrate. But I think that is a really interesting question for us as open infrastructure to look at. Um, in terms of how do we bring locked down content into the open infrastructure and make it far easier in the future for that content to be moved as people do, because I think that's a fundamental key pillar of open um, scholarly communication. In the last minute, is there anything anybody wanted to add before I wrap us all up? Just looking around. I would just, I would just echo what's being said and, uh, and, uh, continue working on the great things that are being done, particularly around support for multilingualism. Um, uh, shout out to the multilingualism interest group uh, that's just spinning up. If anyone doesn't know about it, I uh, encourage you to get in touch with PKP because I think for specifically for national platforms, we're working in multiple languages with many journals. So that's uh, that's of high importance, the high quality metadata and making it as easy as possible for the users to navigate the system in two languages or three languages um, and enter information correctly is uh, is of paramount importance to continue working on all together for sure. Yeah, and a very simplistic individuals like myself will focus on the big numbers around the large tens of thousands. But I think the richness within the fabric of the open publishing infrastructure is this whole thing around the, the development of bibliodiversity against the the fabric of traditional commercial publishing and the, the the nurturing of bibliodiversity. And I think that really is one of the great success stories of the last 25 years of, uh, oh, what a good way to wrap it all up. It's a real success story of the last 25 years for PKP and, and Eredi and, and all of the people within this room. So, and I just want to say thank you to all of you to giving your time to this, these 90 minutes. They're valuable 90 minutes because I know a few of you, it's your evening, it's family time. And so we really do appreciate it. And for those of you early in the morning, Aruj and others, uh, thanks for getting up. Um, and with that, um, I'll wrap it up. Happy birthday or happy anniversary, PKP and Eredi, and um, success to all of you. And uh, I really, in many ways, genuinely hope that uh, PKP as a project is not needed in 25 years time because the idea was to produce an open knowledge open infrastructure system which would be self-supporting without the need for a project to do that and that the, the community as a whole would run it so hopefully we don't do this in 25 years but if we do um, I'm sure we'll have seen a huge amount of, of growth in bibliodiversity and multilingualism to, to national platforms like yourselves so thank you for your contributions and uh, thank you for giving your time to us <laughs>